Thank you very much for the introduction. So, in my lectures, uh, I'd like to talk about the subjects of symmetries and anomalies in quantum field theory. And before starting my lecture, uh, I should uh, make a comment about condensed matter physics. So, the recent developments in the subject of symmetries and anomalies are largely stimulated by topological considerations in condensed matter physics. So, so there is a very good interaction between uh, high energy physics side and condensed matter physics side. And condensed matter people are interested in classification of topological phases of matter. So these topological phases of matter are something like topological insulators, topological superconductors, and so on. So the, these are very important topics in condensed matter physics. However, in my lectures, I will just focus on relativistic uh, quantum field theory, which are relevant for high energy physics. So I will always assume relativity in my lectures. So, so the anomalies uh, uh, which I will talk about will be relevant for particle physics and string theory. <clears throat> okay, so in this first lecture, I first uh, would like to give an overview, uh, but maybe <laughs> my presentation is biased by my own preference. And in later lectures, I will discuss more uh, concrete specific topics uh, related to some topological properties of gauge theories and its application to uh, strong dynamics. Okay, first, uh, let me go to the introduction. So the symmetries and perturbative anomalies are well treated in standard textbooks in quantum field theory and string theory. So I assume that you are already familiar with uh, these standard facts about uh, perturbative anomalies. So I believe that you, are, you have already seen something like this, uh, triangular anomalies, and also anomalies of axial symmetries by Fujikawa's method, and so on. So the examples of how anomalies are used is so first of all, uh, there are anomalies of dynamic gauge symmetries and anomalies of global symmetries. So these anomalies of dynamic gauge symmetries uh, must be canceled for consistency of the theory. For example, the anomaly is canceled in the standard model, SU3 times SU2 times U1, at least in the perturbative level. So in the standard textbooks, uh, you check that uh, the anomaly is canceled in these gauge groups at the part of the level. In fact, it is very non-trivial to check the anomaly cancellation in non part of the level. But uh, at least in the part of the level, it, it's just uh, can be computed by simple uh, computation. And also in string theory, uh, uh, anomalies are important for the selection of possible gauge, non abelian gauge groups. E8 times E8 and SO32 in 10 dimensional supergravity. And anomalies are also important for uh, global symmetries. The anomaly of global symmetry need not to be cancelled, they can be non zero, but they are very useful for the study of strong dynamics. And this was uh, originally discussed by Tufut. So Tufut discussed the chiral symmetry in QCD. Uh, in the massless limit of quarks, QCD has chiral symmetries, SUNF left times SUNF right. And Tufut finds that the anomaly of these chiral symmetries are very convenient. I will review uh, this in later. Uh, and in my talk, I don't distinguish these two types of anomalies. Uh, these two types of anomalies will, be, will not be 
distinguished in my talk. The only difference is that uh, the anomaly of dynamical gauge symmetry must be cancelled for the consistency, but this anomaly of global symmetry need not be cancelled. Now, what is symmetry? So, the textbook answer may be like this. We have fields, this phi x, and we have the action of the field. Then, symmetry means that the action is invariant under the transformation, like this. So, phi x going to some group element acting on this phi, and the action is invariant under this transformation. So this is the textbook description of the symmetry. And what is anomaly? The textbook answer may be like this. The classical action is invariant under this transformation of the field. But uh, quantum mechanically, it is violated, for example, by the pass integral measure from, the, from some regularization. So this is the textbook answer of anomaly. But what I want to emphasize in my lectures is that the concepts of symmetry and anomaly are organized and generalized more and more in recent years. So I'd like to review these developments. So that's the purpose of my lectures. So first, uh, let me briefly give an overview of the symmetry. So what is symmetry in modern understanding? And actually, I don't know. I don't know how to treat them in most general unified way. And I think the terminology, this terminology, symmetry, is not appropriate in some of the generalizations. So the, the concept of symmetry is generalized in various directions. And I feel that uh, more abstract language is necessary for a unified treatment of several generalizations. So let me just mention several generalizations. So, so you are familiar with the usual symmetries, the continuous internal symmetry, discrete symmetry, and space-time symmetry, Lorentz symmetry, and time reversal and so on. However, there are many other generalizations. This higher form symmetry, which I will review in detail in my later lectures, and two group, duality group, topological defect, and maybe others. So, so let me just uh, describe some properties of some of them, because I, I don't know the unified treatment of all of them, so I just uh, describe some properties of some of them. So let's start from the uh, case of uh, usual continuous symmetry. <clears throat> so let's recall the case of this usual symmetry. In this case, uh, we have conserved current, J mu, and this conserved current satisfies uh, this conservation equation, uh, del mu, j mu equals zero. And in the language of differential forms, uh, we can rewrite uh, this conservation equation more beautifully. So let's define uh, uh, this one form by using this current, j mu dx mu. Then we take the Hodge dual of this current then this is a d minus one form. Then this conservation equation uh, just corresponds to this uh, equation. The exterior derivative of this Hodge dual of current is zero. So uh, in the language of differential forms, uh, the conservation equation is very simple. So conservation equation is, is just saying that uh, this Hodge dual is closed. Now, from this uh, current, uh, we can define charge. And to define charge, uh, we pick up some, uh, uh, some surface, 
for dimension 1 surface, or dimension d minus 1, here d is a space time dimension, then we integrate this Hodge dual of the current over this uh, dimension d minus 1 surface. Then we get the charge operator. So this is just the total charge on this surface. Okay, so again, by using differential forms, uh, this is very simple because we just need to integrate this uh, differential form over this uh, co-dimension one uh, sub-manifold. And this uh, charge Q depends on this sigma, but actually this uh, has a property that this is invariant and uh, continuous deformation of this surface. The reason is that uh, 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 this current is closed, this Hodge dual of current is closed, then by using Stokes theorem, uh, we can show that uh, this is invariant and uh, continuous deformation. So, <clears throat> so the proof is very simple. So we just take uh, two surfaces, sigma and sigma prime, then uh, uh, we take uh, some subspace whose boundary is given by this sigma prime and sigma, and then we apply the Stokes theorem and the fact that this current is closed. Then uh, we can conclude that uh, this Q sigma is equal to Q on sigma prime. So in this sense, uh, the dependence on this surface is topological. This, uh, this is topological because uh, we can continuously deform this uh, surface. And physically, uh, this just corresponds to the charge conservation. So the total charge on sigma and the total charge on sigma prime are the same. So this is just the charge conservation. And by exponentiating this uh, charge operator, uh, we get a, a symmetry operator, uh, which I denote by u. This u depends on this surface sigma, and also, also it depends on some, uh, some parameter alpha, uh, which multiplies this uh, charge q here in this uh, exponent. And again, this operator u is topological in the sense that this is invariant under continuous deformation of the surface. So this topological invariance characterize, uh, partially characterize this uh, operator. And also this uh, operator U exists for each group element because, so if we exponentiate this uh, parameter alpha, this alpha can be regarded as an element of D algebra. Then if we exponentiate it, then this is a group element. So, so this uh, operator U depends on uh, the elements of the group, symmetry group. So let me summarize what we found. So the usual symmetry is implemented by this operator U. So this is a topological operator. This is topological in the sense I, uh, I explained before. And here this sigma is a surface, and here this G is some label of this operator, and this was a group element. So, uh, so I derived this in the case of uh, continuous symmetry. But now we can ask uh, several questions. So first of all, does this operator need to be an exponential of some charge? The answer is no, because discrete symmetry has this operator u without uh, the charge. Well, I mean, so in the case of discrete symmetry, uh, we don't have uh, any conserved current, but we still have a symmetry. So, so we don't have uh, conserved current, so we don't have this Q, but we still have this U. Next question is, 
does this surface need to be co-dimension one? And in the case of usual symmetry, uh, usually we integrate the current uh, over the time slice, and time slice has uh, co-dimension one or dimension d minus one. So we are very familiar with the case that this sigma has dimension d minus one. But uh, actually, this need not be co-dimension one. What is called higher form symmetry uses higher co-dimension sigma. I will, uh, in data lectures, I will discuss the details of uh, these higher form symmetries. And another question is, do we need, do we even need a group element? And the answer, surprisingly, the answer is no. There's something called topological defect operator. And this topological defect operator is just characterized by topological invariance. So they are topologically invariant in the sense that uh, they are invariant on the continuous deformation of this sigma. Uh, but they are not labeled by group elements. So, this, so for these topological defect operators, the terminology symmetry is no longer uh, appropriate. Uh, but these operators have uh, very similar properties as this, this uh, symmetry operator U. So there are many generalizations of the concept of symmetry. And let me make a remark. So sometimes these operators cannot be written explicitly in elementary way by using fields. And this may be confusing uh, for students. I mean, in the case of usual symmetries, uh, we can explicitly construct the conserved current by using Neta's procedure. So we can explicitly write the operator, current operator, by using fields. However, for more general symmetries, uh, that may not be possible. Uh, uh, we may have to use more abstract language, uh, more abstract some mathematical concepts, uh, such as fiber bundles, algebraic topology, and so on, to describe more generalized uh, symmetries. OK. So now, uh, if we have symmetries, or more generally, uh, if we have operators, then we can couple these operators to background fields. So the most basic case is uh, just this coupling. So if we have this operator O, then this is just local operator. Then we can couple it to a background field A. This is a background field. And then we can couple it Couple, it, couple them in this way. We just uh, multiply them, integrate uh, over space time, and exponentiate, and then take the exponential uh, expectation value. And I denote this uh, by this ZA. And this ZA is called uh, generating functional of correlation functions or partition function, depending on the context. Uh, but I will use the terminology partition function uh, in my lectures. So this Z is a functional of background field A, and I call this uh, partition function. <laughs> no, I'm not assuming that. Yeah, and, and I believe that very generally, if we have any operator, then there are exists some background field. Uh, but that background field may be very abstract. Uh, uh, let, let, let me give an example later. Yeah. So for the current operator, uh, JMU, uh, the background field is just this A mu. Uh, uh, this is uh, very familiar. So, and the coupling between them is this, uh, A mu, J mu, and in the language of differential form, it is uh, this uh, A wedge product of uh, this positive current. 
And in a similar but uh, more abstract way, uh, the symmetry corresponding to uh, this U can be coupled to uh, background fields. Uh, sorry, maybe I don't discuss the examples, but I believe that any operator can be coupled to some background field. Yeah. Okay, so, so I will uh, write uh, the abstract background fields as A. Uh, this is coupled to, the, to this symmetry operator. And I denote the partition function in the presence of the background field as this Z. And so examples of background fields uh, are like this. So for example, in the case of discrete symmetry, uh, this background field A is a principal uh, G bundle. <coughs> so in the case of usual symmetries, uh, sorry, sorry, in the case of continuous symmetries, uh, we needed to specify both uh, principal G bundle and also uh, the connection on that bundle. But in the case of discrete symmetry, uh, uh, we just need to specify principal G bundle on uh, space time manifold. And for higher form symmetry, such as P form symmetry, uh, the background field takes values in cohomology. Uh, this H P plus one is a, a cohomology group, uh, P plus one dimensional cohomology group. And uh, we have to use some abstract cohomology whose coefficient is the group here. So for example, if the group is uh, Zn, uh, the coefficient of this uh, sim uh, cohomology group is Zn. I think most of you are not familiar with uh, this cohomology group, but uh, anyway, so we need some mathematics. And uh, we also have parity and time reversal symmetry. Uh, they are space-time symmetries. And we learn them in standard textbooks, uh, but we don't learn the background field uh, for these symmetries. And modern understanding is that the background field for time reversal symmetry is a manifold itself, but non-orientable manifold. This is because uh, parity or time reversal symmetry, they uh, flip the orientation of the manifold. So because they flip the orientation, uh, we, we can consider non-orientable manifold as a background field for them. Uh, example is a Klein bottle. Klein bottle uh, is not orientable. In this language, uh, if we consider the background gauge field to be the manifold itself, yes. um, what would it imply to couple the uh, gauge field to the, let's say, the operator for parity? Um, I'm like, uh, Sorry, I in, the, in, the, in, the, in the form of coupling, like, like in the, on the previous slide, you had uh, the gauge field or, or, or the background field coupling to the uh, operator, right? Mm -hmm. So what would it imply to couple the manifold to the operator? Uh, I'm not sure. It, uh, it's not clear to me. It's just that. I mean, so, so uh, OK. So here, this coupling is just for usual internal symmetry. Right. But the point is that uh, this time reversal or parity symmetries are space-time symmetries. Mm -hmm. So their background fields are metric. Or manifold. So space oh, you mean the same. metric then? The, yeah. Then you mean yeah. the metric on this uh, non-oriented yeah, yeah, yeah. manifold? Yeah, yeah, So metric can be regarded as a background field. Okay. For them. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. So let me again make remarks. So as uh, examples I gave show, the abstract description of the background fields uh, require mathematical concepts from topology and geometry. So if you are very interested in this subject, then I recommend you to learn some basic 
concepts from topology and geometry. But if you don't like mathematics, then don't worry too much because some simple cases can be treated in elementary ways. So uh, even without uh, knowing very advanced mathematics, uh, there is still something you can do. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so uh, this concludes the uh, overview of the symmetry. And now I want to discuss uh, anomalies from the modern understanding. So what is anomaly in modern understanding? And for anomalies, there is now a way to, which is believed to describe uh, almost all anomaly. Here, almost means that uh, I don't know how to treat uh, conformal anomaly in this framework, but except for conformal anomaly, I believe that uh, uh, we can treat all anomalies uh, in a very unified way. So let me explain this. So first, let me remind you the uh, notation. So I denote by A the abstract background fields, uh, by Z the partition function in the presence of the background field. And uh, I denote the space-time manifold by this M. So this M is a d-dimensional space-time manifold. And, and we can consider it as a part of the background fields for space-time symmetry such as Lorentz symmetry and time reversal symmetry. So this is just notation. OK, now the modern understanding of the anomaly is the following. So first of all, anomaly means that the partition function is ambiguous. And usually, uh, what we learn is that uh, if we perform some gauge transformation, then the uh, phase of the partition function changes. And in that way, uh, the partition function is ambiguous because uh, it changes by gauge transformation. That's the uh, uh, usual way we learn uh, anomaly. But uh, modern understanding uh, is a slightly different. Uh, if we take a d plus one dimensional manifold, which I denote by n, whose boundary is the space-time manifold n, and on which the background field fields a are extended, as in this figure, then the partition function is fixed uh, without any ambiguity. So we take uh, some d plus one dimensional manifold n whose boundary is this m, and we extend the background fields to n, then partition function is completely fixed. So, so this partition function has no ambiguity if we are given this n and the extension of the background field into n. And the modern interpretation is that the dependence on n is the anomaly. So this, uh, this is the modern uh, interpretation. This is because we are originally interested in uh, the theory on this uh, d-dimensional manifold m. Uh, but to fix the partition function, we have to extend it to d plus one dimension. So if the partition function depends on this d plus one dimensional manifold, then uh, that is uh, interpreted as an anomaly. And yes. No, that's a very good question. So uh, it's not always possible. And in that case, there are some additional ambiguities uh, if this extension is not possible. But these additional ambiguities has a physical interpretation, actually, uh, as a theta angle. I don't have time to explain that point. But uh, 
there is some physical interpretation also in that. Okay, case. thank you. In the usual sense, space-time manifold means the, I mean, I assume some orientability. Do you assume the manifold should be orientable? No, most general case, uh, I don't assume orientability. Assume orientability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For example, uh, M-theory can be defined on unorientable manifold, such as Klein bottle. So, uh, yeah. But in the general relativity, um, space-time manifold should be orientable, we assume, maybe. No, so that, I think you are assuming the standard model of particle physics uh, yeah, in part four dimensions. In that case, uh, the manifold must be orientable. That's right. Yeah. But uh, in more general cases, uh, we don't need to assume that. Okay, okay. Yeah. thank you. And indeed, M theory can be formulated on non-orientable manifold. There can be very different Ah, many different, eh? yeah, yeah. Huh? Extension of, eh, yeah, 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 yes. There are many, I will explain that point later, yes. Because that's very important. Yeah. Okay, let me ask you. In the, uh, in the sense of the body category, also uh, you extend on this kind of thing. Uh, sorry. You extend the proper field theory on the base of the body category. Can you extend on this kind of thing? Higher dimensional group. Uh, this, uh, this question is to be uh, related to this question. You have uh, some kind of the topological field theory in the extended version, and then you can find of the uh, track of the uh, <coughs> sense for classification of the sense on the base of the boundary of the boundary. And then you can have extend the difference to higher, you know. Uh, uh, Okay, that's. That's I think the you know the coupling the relief coupling now and ask about this kind of thing. Sorry, I <coughs> cannot give clear answer to your question. I, yes, in some cases, it it's interesting to extend it to not only to uh, d plus uh, one but also d plus two, d plus three, or yeah. many other dimensions. That in some cases that's very interesting, but. Um, Sorry, in these lectures, I don't talk about uh, them. Excuse me. Uh, saying the dependence on A means uh, topologically or geometrically. The, de huh? the dependence on N, on N means topologically or geometrically. Uh, it can be geometrically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both so cases. Well, for example, well, we. we have to specify explicit metric on N, and this may depend on that metric. Oh, so in so some cases it is topologically. This, uh, this is, dependence is not necessarily topological. Yeah, it can be uh, Geometric. geometrical. Uh, but there's a uh, difference. If this dependence is geometrical, uh, that corresponds to, actually, it turns out that that corresponds to Part of the anomaly. And if this dependence is uh, just topological, then it turns out that uh, it is global. What is called global anomaly? Oh, yeah. Thank yes, you. So, different. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, so, hello. Uh, on your left. Hmm? Sir, yeah. hmm? excuse me. So, I have a similar type of question. I'm, how, I mean, N is, how N is unique, I mean, uh, be, because this G function depends on the metric on N, so uh, uh, how is, I mean, N is unique for a theory or we can have different type of N for one theory? Hmm? Uh, this, this A is a, just a background field, so, uh -huh. uh, I mean, so if we, yeah, the most simple case is just uh, continuous global symmetry. I mean, if we have a continuous global symmetry, then, then we can introduce some background field. 
and we can couple it. Same like, right, let's see. Does it answer your question? Uh, yeah, I'll talk to you later. I don't understand. Uh, he, he asked about N. N, N, capital N. N. Is N unique? Is, uh, ah, okay, so this N, N. Uh, yeah, right. Ah, okay, okay, this is not unique, and that is important, so I will later discuss that point. Okay. This is not unique. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. That, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, I have a question. Uh, so uh, when you are integrating the current to get the conserved charges, so basically you're integrating over uh, an abstract manifold here, so is it necessary that the manifold has to be space-like or could it be like, uh, I mean, there is no restriction. I mean, can it have, for example, a, a higher genus surfaces or can it be time-like? Uh, but because generally, like, when you Absolutely. do a... Hamiltonian decomposition, you just consider a time-like slice. So can it be, uh, like, the ma can, the si can the sigma essentially be uh, arbitrary? Sorry, I forgot to say that I always work in Euclidean signature. So, oh, okay. sorry, yeah. So they are all Euclidean manifold. And then there is no restriction. Yeah, we can ha uh, consider higher genus uh, surfaces and so on. Okay, but in yeah. Lorenzian, I mean, is it re necessary to restrict it to a uh, space like, uh, like a, spa a time like slice? I mean, I always consider in Euclidean okay. space, so yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a, a simple question. And uh, the, can M has a boundary? Can, M. can. M has. M, M. And uh, in that case, uh, what happened? Yeah, it M can have boundaries, but. <laughs> Uh, I mean, the, the, uh, that, that, it sounds that, like a yeah. boundary of boundaries uh, yeah, yeah, empty, yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, if M has, uh, given M has boundary, then... Uh, yeah, I mean, mathematicians consider such situations, actually. Uh, but that is very <laughs> difficult mathematics, uh, I, which I cannot explain. So, yeah, I mean, considering uh, this manifold M with boundary <laughs> is interesting, but I cannot explain. Sorry. Uh, if you are interested, uh, so, so, I mean, mathematicians like Fried and Hopkins, they discuss what is called uh, ex fully extended topological quantum field theory. So uh, you, can, you may look at their paper. Okay, so, so I described uh, how to consider anomalies, uh, but this description of anomaly may look uh, quite abstract, uh, but there is actually a very natural motivation for, uh, from the condensed matter physics and also the physics of domain world fermions. Uh, in the context of condensed matter physics, uh, we have some material and uh, let's consider the case that uh, this material is what is called topological phase. So these topological phases are uh, some gapped phases. Uh, they don't have uh, any degrees of freedom, but they are... <coughs> so condensed matter physicists classify uh, phases of uh, matter by using topology. And so we have... Uh, so we have something here in the bulk. Then on the boundary, uh, we can get anomalous theory on this uh, boundary, on this surface or domain wall. And this boundary is interpreted as this space-time manifold M. And the point is that the condensed matter system or lattice system uh, Anomal, uh, not anomalous, sorry, not anomalous as a whole. So if we have a complete, UV complete uh, lattice realization of the system, uh, then the theory is not anomalous. So this total system is not anomalous. So the part, then the partition function is uniquely specified for this total system. But it looks anomalous if we only look at 
the surface uh, of this uh, material. So on this surface, uh, we can realize anomalous theory. Let me give an example. The simplest example uh, is uh, uh, given by what is called quantum core system. Uh, this has uh, d equal to 2 and t plus 1 equal to 3. And the symmetry we are interested is u1. And practically, uh, this is u1 of uh, quantum electrodynamics. Now, uh, we are considering uh, two dimensions. Uh, then, anomalous theory, we consider anomalous theory, which is chiral fermion in d equal to. So let's consider chiral fermion. Then the situation is like this. So in the bulk two plus one dimensions, we have what is called quantum hole state. This bulk is gapped. This, gap, uh, this bulk has a large mass gap. But on the surface, on this boundary, uh, we get anomalous chiral fermions, two-dimensional chiral fermions. So on the surface of matter exhibiting the quantum hole effect, there appears chiral fermions, uh, which have anomaly under U1. And let me denote the background field uh, by this A. Uh, so this is, a, this is written as a one form. Then the bulk action of the quantum hole system in three dimensions is given by this action. So this is a famous uh, Chan Simons type uh, action. So this A is, is uh, background field. Uh, and we integrate this A, D, A over the bulk three dimensions. So this is the definition of the bulk theory. And I, I remark that this A is just the background field. So the action is written purely by background field. So there's no dynamical degrees of freedom in the bulk. So this, is, this bulk theory is almost trivial. This is almost trivial, but this is slightly non-trivial by this uh, bulk action of background field. Now let, let's get, uh, perform gauge transformation. So we perform gauge transformation, delta A equal D alpha. Here this alpha is a gauge transformation parameter. Then the action is uh, changed under this gauge transformation uh, like this. So we get D alpha, D A integrate over the bulk. And by using Stokes theorem, we can uh, write this as an integral over the boundary two-dimensional two boundary. So we integrate over, we integrate alpha times this dA over the boundary. And so the point is that uh, this bulk action is not gauge invariant. This is not the gauge invariant if there is a boundary. And this uh, term precisely cancels against the anomaly of the boundary fermion. So, so the total system is like this. The total partition function is given by this, uh, the product of two factors. The first factor is a partition function of the boundary fermion. And the second factor is uh, uh, the action of the bulk topological phase. So this is a partition function of the bulk, and this is a partition function of the boundary. Then each of these terms are not gauge invariant, but their product is gauge invariant. So in this way, uh, by extending the manifold to one higher dimensions, uh, we can define, we can fix the partition function in a gauge invariant way.
And more generally, anomalies are completely characterized by p plus one dimensional topological phases. So let me explain it. So there are some questions about uh, uniqueness of this uh, extension n. And I stress that this is not unique. So let's take uh, two extensions, this n, and let's take this n prime. So there are two different extensions, this n and the n prime. Then let's see the relation between them. From these two manifolds, uh, we can get a closed manifold by gluing uh, these two, this n and n prime, uh, in this way. We can glue them together, and we get a closed manifold, which I denote by this x. Then, the partition function defined by this n and the partition function defined by n prime are different. They are different. And if we take their ratio, then it turns out that uh, this ratio is given by some partition function of some theory on x, this closed manifold. So the anomaly is characterized by this d plus one dimensional partition function, this z x on the closed manifold. And this zx is the partition function of the topological phase. Uh, I gave an example of this zx. So in the case of a quantum hole system, uh, this zx is a, is a chan simons invariant of background field. Now, if the partition function, this zx, is just equal to one, if this is just identity, then there is no anomaly because uh, if this zx equal one, then that means from this equation that uh, the partition function defined by n and defined by n prime uh, equal, and that means that the partition function is independent of n. So if the bulk partition function on closed manifold is just equal to one, then there is no anomaly. So this zx is really the partition function, uh, sorry, so this zx is the partition function which characterizes the anomaly, and this is the partition function of d, d, d plus one dimensional theory. This d plus one dimensional theory is uh, called by condensed matter physicist by as symmetry protected topological phases, or SPT phases. And it is called, also called invertible field theory by mathematicians. Yes? Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, orientation must be inverted. Oh, yeah, yeah I understand that. Yeah, mm. But uh, I don't understand why partition function should be inverted um, 1 over g. 1 over g? Sorry, what is it? I mean, look at your uh, next uh, few graphs. So mm -hmm. here you have uh, gn over gn prime. Mm -hmm. Because you put it in denominator because the uh, orientation was inverted, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, why? Okay, so. So this partition function, uh, total partition function, is uh, a product of some boundary partition function and, uh, sorry, sorry, and bulk partition function. And in this ratio, uh, first of all, this boundary partition function cancels. So we just need to focus on this uh, bulk uh, partition function. And this bulk part is, this part is uh, exponential of i 
S. This S is a uh, uh, this S is the uh, action of the bulk theory. Uh, and this S is just written by background fields. Then if we take the inverse of this, then we get a minus sign here. So the sign of the action is uh, changed. And so this is, I'm cheating a little bit, but <laughs> if we change the orientation of the manifold, then it is known that uh, the sign of the action is reversed. Well, more precisely speaking, the topological part of the action is, is the sign of the topological part of the action is reversed. Ah, okay, 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 okay. And it's not that difficult. I mean, so ju let's just consider this uh, case of uh, Chan Simon's uh, action. Then this is an integral of three form over three dimensional manifold. And if we change the orientation, then the definition of the integral of uh, differential forms change by minus sign. So that's the reason that we get minus sign. Okay, Yeah, yeah, there is actually a general statement. Uh, yes, uh, for, okay, let's, uh, okay. The, no, no, in general, in the, in general, no, there's some problem. Uh, no, no, so there's a very general statement. So, We consider bulk action and let's write this as exponential of something. And I'm working in Euclidean signature. And in that case, the action has real part and imaginary part. Okay, in Euclidean signature, the action is not real, but it has real part and imaginary part. And uh, this real part does not have any interesting topology. And the thing we discuss, topological phases of matter, uh, we don't consider this term. Uh, well, we just set it equal to zero. So this, this part is just zero. So we have this imaginary part, then, uh, from unitarity, uh, it follows that uh, uh, this changes, this changes the sign. And the uh, uh, orientation flip. Uh, this is very generally known, but uh, it's, <laughs> uh, it's not so easy to explain. I mean, yeah, you this. told me that this is quite elementary, so what in Euclidean theory is there's no notion of interest yeah, 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 yeah. reflection positivity. Yeah. Reflection positivity, yes, yes, yes. yes. Hmm? Okay. 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 Yeah, but, but that's a good point. Yeah, and reflection positivity implies what I said.
Yes. So、uh, the anomaly is characterized by this partition function in d plus one dimension. So let me give example. In the case of perturbative anomaly,、uh, there is、uh, something which is called descent equation. And usual perturbative anomaly is described by the so called descent equation by using the gauge field. So let's denote the field strength by F. Then in D plus two dimensions,、uh, we have some polynomial of this、uh, field strength F. And then we descend to D plus one dimension、uh, by this equation. So we、uh, describe this D plus two dimensional form as a total derivative. Total exterior derivative of、uh, some d plus one dimensional form. And this is essentially the Chan Simons、uh, form. And then we integrate this over x. Then we get the generalized version of Chan Simons invariant. And part of the anomalies are described by this partition function. So in the case of quantum hole system, uh, this uh, I. 2 plus 2, so quantum hole system has d equal to 2, so this is 2 plus 2, and this polynomial is just given by f squared. Then we descend to three dimensions, and then we get this Chan Simons term. So the Patabat b a n o m a l y can be just described by、uh, this Chan Simons、uh, action. But this、uh, Chan Simons action can be used only for perturbative anomalies of continuous symmetries. And more generally,、uh, we can have global anomalies. Examples of global anomalies are, are like this. The most famous example is the SU2 gauge theory with a doublet while fermion in four dimensions. So, this is a very famous、uh, Witten's、uh, global anomaly. SU2 anomaly. But there are many, many, many other、uh, global anomalies. And recent developments are about these global anomalies. There are many, 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 many others. So,、uh, for example, the, all the anomalies of discrete symmetries are global anomalies. Discrete symmetry does not have any perturbative anomaly, they only have global anomaly. So, discrete symmetry means something like Zn or time reversal symmetry or so on. For example,、uh, what is called topological insulators and topological、uh, superconductors are、uh, uh, related to anomalies of this time reversal symmetry. And we then proposed、uh, a formula. For general、uh, fermion theory. So, this is a formula we can propose.、Uh, the bulk partition, d plus one dimensional partition function, is given by exponential of、uh, what is called、uh, Atiyapat Singer data invariant.、Uh, I don't have time to explain this Atiyapat Singer data invariant, uh, but uh, let me just make one comment. So, this data invariant is Perturbatively, this eta invariant is、uh, just equal to、uh, this Chan Simons invariant.、Uh, but this eta invariant contains more information. And、uh, by using this eta invariant,、uh, we can describe global anomalies. And there are also many other global anomalies. And They are produced not only by fermions, but by many other、uh, theories. So sometimes、uh, even a bosonic system can produce anomalies. And all these、uh, global anomalies are classified by the so called cobordism group. And again, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have time to explain、uh, this cobordism group.、Uh, if you are interested,、uh, 
I recommend the papers by Kapustin and collaborators. But the point is that uh, by looking at the cobotism group, uh, we can see what anomaly is possible in a given dimension uh, with a given symmetry group. So if this cobotism group is uh, computed by mathematicians, then, then that means that we know the classification of global anomaly. Some cobotism groups are already computed by mathematicians, and some are not, so we may have to compute them by ourselves. Discrete or continuous? Uh, sorry, what is? Is the cobotism group is it continuous or discrete or, or can be both? What do you mean by continuous? Continuous group. Ah, continuous group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, yeah, yeah. The global anomalies of continuous groups are also classified by cobotism groups. I don't know for, example, I for example, for um, example, we tend SU to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Example is, uh, I mean, I don't explain the examples of, of cobotism groups, but the fact is that this SU2 anomaly, we tend the SU2 anomaly with a double fermion, this can be described by the cobotism group. That is known. I mean, cobotism group itself is a continuous group or could be a discrete group, but that group itself. Cobotism group itself is, I believe, always a discrete. So in this case of SU2 in four dimension, the cobotism group is actually Z2. Uh, so we are interested in SU2 in four dimension. So the anomaly is, is characterized by five dimension. Then uh, we need to consider five-dimensional cobotism group. Uh, I don't explain the details, but uh, it is known that uh, this anomaly is classified by something which depends on SU2 group. And this group is known to be Z2, if I remember correctly. <laughs> um, I think it's okay, maybe. And this Z2 is exactly the Witten's anomaly. So if we take two doublets, then the theory is anomaly free. So that corresponds to this Z2. If we multiply the non trivial element of Z2 by two, then it's, it is trivial. And more generally, uh, I believe that the cobotism group is always uh, some discrete group. OK, so this concludes the uh, overview of the anomaly. Now, in the rest of this lecture, uh, I'd like to give a sketch of uh, applications of this defined concepts of symmetries and anomalies. And there are many applications, so I only sketch a few of them. And in particular, I discuss uh, topics which is related to my own works. So there are applications to Bones string theory and quantum field theory, and in particular, strong dynamics. So, so let me first uh, sketch the application to string theory. But I don't discuss the details. I just sketch uh, uh, how the anomaly is important in string theory. So it is very well known that, uh, it is very well known how the part of the anomalies are cancelled in string theory. So if you read the textbook of, for example, uh, Kolchinsky, then, then you know how to uh, derive uh, this E8 class E8 or SO32 in 10-dimensional supergravity. But that does not mean uh, 
that we have the complete picture of anomaly cancellation in string theory. So the textbook describes only perturbative anomaly cancellation, but there are many more global anomalies. So we have to care about these global anomalies. So there are many more subtle global anomalies and more subtle topological structures in string, uh, string theory. So let me uh, sketch it. The topological aspect uh, which I'm going to discuss is about the flux quantization. String theory contains uh, several higher form gauge fields, uh, such as Ramon Ramon uh, P form fields, uh, this Ramon Ramon fields. And the flux is uh, this field of strength F, uh, often said to have integral periods due to uh, direct quantization condition. So I think if we, I think it is written in Polchinski's textbook. So it says that uh, if we integrate this uh, flux over some p plus one cycle, then this must be integer up to some normalization constant. So this is usually said to be necessary for uh, the consistency of the theory. This is, uh, this is derived by uh, Dirac quantization condition. But is this always integer? There's actually an example in which this is not integer. So another well-known fact in string theory is that the OP brain RR charges are given by uh, this one, up to sign. This 2 to P minus 5. So this means that the integral of this flux around the OP plane uh, is given by this. So this is not integer uh, if this uh, P is less than 5. So it seems that uh, the OP plane violates uh, flux quantization because uh, uh, violates Dirac quantization because this is not integer. So, so it seems that the Dirac quantization condition is violated in string theory. So we have to worry that uh, the string theory might be inconsistent. So to, to study this issue, uh, let us recall the argument of the Dirac quantization. So let us recall how we derive the quantization condition. The sketch of the Dirac quantization condition is as follows. So suppose that we have an open here, and suppose that uh, we have we have some D brain around this open. So let's consider D brain world volume M around this uh, open. Then this uh, D brain is coupled to the uh, Ramon Ramon field by this coupling. So this Ramon Ramon field is produced by this open, and this D brain is coupled to that field. Now, if we take an extension of, the, of this M to some one higher dimensions, then by using Stokes theorem, we can rewrite uh, this integral as an integral of this flux over N, like this. This is just uh, the Stokes theorem. But we can take another manifold, N prime. Then, again, by using Stokes theorem, we can write this coupling over, uh, as the integral over N prime. Then if we compare them, then the ratio of this integral over N and integral over N prime is given by the integral over x, this closed manifold. 
which is obtained by gluing this n and n prime. Now, if the quantization condition is violated, then this integral is not equal to 1. So this is not 1 if the charge is not integer. And that means that the integral over n and n prime are different. But they should describe the same Ramon Ramon coupling. So we get an inconsistency. So this is the argument of direct quantization. So but uh, didn't we see similar figures before? You may or may not have forgotten, but let me repeat uh, the figures. So I described these figures in the context of anomalies. So to define the partition function of field theory, I took extension to n or n prime, and by gluing them, I get a closed manifold. Then the partition function defined by n and n prime differ by the factor, this uh, zx. So anomaly is characterized by this d plus one dimensional partition function. And anomaly means that this partition function is not equal to one. So this was the anomaly. Now let's go back to the uh, system of the D-brain. The total partition function of the D-brain is given by this product. This first factor is the partition function of world volume fields, such as fermions, gauge fields, and so on. And this second factor is the coupling to ramon ramon field. Then, by taking the ratio of this product, defined on n and n prime, uh, we get uh, this product. So we get the product of this d plus one dimensional partition function and the exponential of the integral of the flux. So, so this means that the inconsistency of the world volume d brain, world volume d brain, is controlled by, not by this partition function or the integral of f, but by their combination, this combination. And the anomaly-free condition of the d brain is that the product is equal to 1. So the exponential of this flux integral can be, uh, can be something non-trivial, and, and this bulk partition function can be something non-trivial, but their product must be equal to 1. So the conclusion is that the flux is uh, not quantized uh, in string theory, but the quantization condition is shifted by something, which I denote by Q. So this Q is a quantity uh, which is controlled by the anomaly of the world volume of d brain. So, yes. Yeah, an orient manifold is more subtle, but yeah, basically we have. Yeah, about pin structure, not spin structure. Sorry, we have yeah. five so maybe you can ask the question. Yes, so, so, so what I want to emphasize is that uh, the anomalies are really important for some classification of topological structure in string theory. So if there is a, some anomaly, then, 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 then depending on the anomaly, uh, these fluxes take different values. And in principle, this can also affect uh, the uh, string compactification and real world. Uh, because, so if we, for example, if 
we consider some Calabria threefold compactification, and then if there is anomaly, then the fluxes we can introduce is something like this. So the zero fluxes may be excluded, on, and we may have to introduce some fractional fluxes. So it really affects uh, string theory compactification. So it, in principle, it can be very important. And I also want to discuss application to strong dynamics, but maybe we should take a break here. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, yes, I'm running out of time, and yeah. <laughs> Uh, you said that uh, this formalism can explain uh, almost every kind of anomalies except uh, such as conformal anomaly. So yeah. can you tell me why conformal anomaly cannot be explained in this way? Maybe it, it may be possible to describe conformal anomaly also by this framework, but I, don't, I just don't know how to do that. So, so if you find how to do that, then you can write a paper. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Can you explain the relationship between this anomaly and the Fujikawa method? Sorry, could you repeat? Uh, can you explain uh, the relationship between this anomaly and the Fujikawa method based on the integral method anomaly? Uh, of, Fujikawa method, oh, okay, so, yeah, this, yeah, yeah. so these discussions are more general than Fujikawa's method. For example, Fujikawa's method cannot describe uh, the, general global anomalies, such as SU2 Witten's anomaly. So to describe the global anomalies, we have to use this formalism. Yes, but can it reduce to the Fujikawa's method? Or can, how can it reduce to? Ah, reduce to? Uh -huh. yeah. uh, it can be reduced to uh, Fujikawa's result, but uh, I don't know how to explain it in simple ways. It, it can be reduced to the physical set, but <laughs> sorry, let, let me consider it. Can you make some comments on when such um, the bulk n cannot be found? For um, when bulk is not bound. Yeah. Okay. So. Let's just consider uh, S4, and uh, then let's consider SU, SU2 gauge field on uh, S4, uh, which has non-trivial instant on number. Then this cannot be extended to uh, one higher dimensions. The reason is that, uh, so suppose that we have some, suppose that we have some extension, N, uh, whose uh, boundary is uh, S4, and if the gauge, SU2 gauge field is extended to this uh, five-dimensional manifold, then, then this instant number is zero, must be zero because uh, uh, if we consider this instant number, then by using Stokes theorem, 
we can write it as exterior derivative of this trace of f squared. And this exterior derivative is, is just zero by Bianchi identity. So, so in the presence of the instanton, we cannot take this n. And this is, the reason is that uh, um, How should I say? So the reason is that uh, the, in this case, the partition function has an ambiguity. So because we cannot take this n, that means the partition function has additional uh, ambiguity. And that additional ambiguity exactly corresponds to the theta angle. We can introduce the uh, uh, theta angle of this SU2 gauge field. So this is the physical situation. Thank you.